Shall we uh, introduce Hello, uh, who we are and Thank what we're doing today? Thank you for joining our tutorial titled User Use Experience it. When Creating Web3D Scenes. We are a group of five researchers, ah, and I would like to introduce my colleagues, Teresa Hardy, Nicholas Paulus, Don Brussman, Fang Liu, and myself, Amela Sadegic. There are three aims of our tutorial. First and foremost, we would like to generate interest in Web3D and X3D among the entry-level audiences. We also briefly review what we know about user interfaces and user experiences and call on researchers and designers of user interfaces to add Web3D applications to their portfolio. And lastly, we call the attention of programmers and designers of user interfaces to a range of user needs that need to be addressed through their work. We also hope that we will be able to encourage researchers to share their most recent studies on user experiences in 3D environments, and we invite them to showcase the best use cases of user experiences on diverse set of platforms. All presenters that you are going to hear today are also members of Web3D UX committee, and we will introduce the work of this group at the end of our tutorial. We will start our tutorial by introducing the categories of X3D users and the basic postulates of adoption of innovation. In our case, just to clarify, we have in mind adoption of Web3D effort and X3D standard. Our colleague, uh, Teresa Hardy, will highlight the perspective of web developers. That segment will be followed by Don Brutzman's X3D Weather Globe example and Fang Liu considerations of usability testing in 2D and 3D environments. Nicholas Paulus will conclude our tutorial by reviewing the basics of evaluation of user experience. So let's start with the first segment. This segment has three objectives. I will introduce the categories of X3D users and basic postulates of adoption of innovations. Here, I have in mind adoption of technology. I will then connect both and review the needs of X3D user categories in the light of technology adoption. We hope that uh, a good portion of our audience is familiar with the Web3D Consortium and X3D. For colleagues uh, who are just starting in this space, I will highlight the major characteristics of both Web3D and X3D. The Web3D Consortium is an international nonprofit member funded organization that is focused on development of industry standards. The organization was founded in 1997 and members come from a range of domains, business, academia, government, as well as uh, military. The members of the consortium develop and maintain royalty-free ISO standards for web-based 3D graphics. X3D um, is open, royalty-free, extensible, interoperable file format that runs on all platforms, including desktop and tablets. It has a rich set of features that are used for engineering and scientific visualization, for example, and other applications like CAD architecture, medical visualizations, multimedia, and even entertainment. A prominent role that we see in X3D is its platform independence. And the fact that 3D content is presented as device and language neutral. When I talked about Web3D and X3D, it's clear that focus is on the needs of human operators and their usability plays a significant role. And that's the reason why we dedicated so many elements of our tutorials to the topic of usability. We distinguished four categories of X3D users. They include developers of X3D standard, designers of user interfaces and programmers, 
developers of 3D environments and end users' experiences, and at the end, naive users of X3D applications. Let me review the first two categories. Developers of X3D standards are individuals with uh, extensive knowledge in technology in general, but more specifically 3D computer graphics domain, X3D and other file formats, international standards and principles that they need to adhere and support through their work. Uh, at some point in their careers, they assumed that they had roles uh, of other user categories. Their responsibilities include fine-tuning of current elements of X3D standards and proposing new elements that are directly related to user experience. You remember that we said that efforts of Web3D and X3D are all geared to support human operator and user experience. They also need to understand how different aspects of user experience correlate to elements of X3D that they're considering and approving. The second category includes uh, UE designers and programmers. These individuals have advanced programming skills and they leverage X3D and functionality uh, crafted and uh, approved by developers of X3D standards. And they use that functionality to design and develop best experience for the users and of course, while doing that, they are optimizing uh, usability of the interface. So their specific needs are reflected in understanding of principles of designing Web3D user interface, and they use um, uh, typical usability checklists to do their work. Developers of uh, 3D environments and end user experiences may not have high programming skills, but they definitely have to have intimate knowledge of the domain for which they work uh, and support, uh, create 3D environments. Uh, they also need to use functionality of applications to create 3D environments and uh, user experience. So their needs are best expressed in uh, understanding uh, and uh, needing all materials that will present them and inform them about best practices in designing 3D environments to achieve most effective experiences for the users. And they also use a number of case studies to inform themselves about best practices in that domain. And at the end, we have naive users of X3D applications. Those are individuals with um, most likely no programming skills. Um, they may not even know that they are using uh, X3D uh, underneath their that application. Um, they use functionality of the application through the interface. And to them, user interface is the system. They, they see the entire application through the user interface. Um, they, their desire is to invest minimum effort to learn how to use that interface. So the learning of a new interface should be as minimal as possible. And ideally, they would like to uh, be in a situation where everything that they learned in one application, for example, interaction techniques, um, a way to navigate or a way to manipulate with object, if they learn it in one application, that knowledge should be transferable, be the same or very similar to their experience of interaction in totally different application. Their needs uh, are expressed in um, manuals uh, and in most cases, uh, uh, subtle in-session guidance and system prompts to affordances of user interface that they are experiencing. To talk about adoption of technology, I'm going to introduce the elements of diffusion innovation as proposed uh, by Everett Rogers and his team. So diffusion of innovation, uh, according to Everett Rogers, is a process in which innovation is communicated through certain channels over the time and among the members of a social system. So there are four elements that are important here. Uh, innovation itself, um, channels of communication, time it takes to convey that message, 
and people, uh, social system in which uh, they appear. They are also um, individuals who introduced uh, adopter categories that we are all familiar with, uh, innovators, early adopters, early and late majority and laggards, as well as um, uh, special roles that they gave to some adopters, opinion leaders and the importance in uh, influencing adoption, uh, change agents and change agents uh, aids. If you're interested in uh, details of this theory, I highly recommend uh, um, studying this uh, resource, very important resource. So I present here a S curve that is typical um, adoption curve, uh, represents cumulative diffusion growth of um, a number of users over the time. and. Uh, our interest is really not to follow S curve, but to make sure that S curve is shifted, shifted in time. So adopter categories, uh, people who adopt innovation, they happen in larger number and sooner. There are five factors that influence adoption. They include perceived attributes of innovation, and I'll, I will reflect on those um, in a minute type of innovation decision process. It can be done by individual, by collective like organization or census entire society. The communication channels, uh, they, uh, they refer to the way in which message can uh, be passed from one individual to another one. And we can certainly think about uh, different kinds of uh, media and advertising, but also grassroots efforts that may happen. The nature of social system, some um, social groups uh, may have mechanism that um, support adoption of innovation or prevent it. And uh, lastly, the extent of change agents promotion efforts. Let me review perceived attributes of innovation. When we say perceived attributes, we have in mind the perception um, as done by uh, adopters. So relative advantage uh, relates to uh, benefits of innovation of a current solution. And again, I emphasize benefits as seen by adopters, not objective value, uh, objective benefits, but as seen by the adopters. And if adopters see bigger benefits of innovation over current system, for example, then they are more likely to uh, adopt that innovation. Com compatibility refers to a degree of being consistent with the uh, current system of values or you know, past experiences and needs of potential uh, adopters. And of course, higher level of compatibility um, is likely to um, result in easier adoption, easier and faster adoption. Complexity is defined as a degree to which and innovation is seen as difficult, um, both to understand and use. And of course, uh, innovations that are simpler to understand and simpler to use, uh, they result uh, with uh, faster adoption. Trailability is uh, uh, ability to experiment with innovation, to reduce certainty, to learn by doing. And adoption, for example, um, that are possible in incremental fashion they're faster to adopt. So if we can try something a little bit and see if we like it, uh, chances are the adoption can happen uh, faster. Uh, changing our entire practice uh, overnight uh, and replacing with everything that we knew so far is um, uh, unlikely to result in adoption of masses, for example. And observ observability um, reflects, uh, is reflected in the results of adoption being visible to other adopters. Uh, so that will be counted as best advertising and that will influence adoption, making it faster. So the question that we ask ourselves is uh, this one, how can we um, affect, uh, and of course there we have in mind positive effect, how can we affect adoption of X3D? 
to give answers to that uh, question, I'm going to bring elements of the fusion of innovation and technology adoption uh, into Web3D and X3D realm. So for example, if we talk about uh, uh, attributes of uh, innovation, uh, perceived attributes of innovation, uh, we can discuss um, relative advantage. Uh, and if you remember, we introduced it as uh, uh, advantages, benefits of uh, uh, innovation of a current way of doing um, some current practices. So for developers and programmers, interoperability, independence, from devices and languages, uh, having uh, file formats and standards that are royalty free, uh, be able to do uh, faster coding are all good, good um, values uh, that uh, serve as incentive to uh, adopt um, X3D system. For developers of 3D environment and user experiences, uh, what needs to happen to make sure that uh, naive users see all those uh, new applications as beneficial, they have to carefully match user needs with uh, system design and uh, capabilities. Of course, selection of sensory modalities, user input and output devices um, has to be carefully done, uh, as well as uh, selection of 3D environment, interaction techniques, uh, and so on. And of course, product uh, should not uh, go and uh, be presented to naive users, to intended users, without doing evaluation of effectiveness of that system. Compatibility, um, we introduced it as a degree to which uh, current solutions are uh, supportive of uh, well-established practices and uh, system of values. And so if um, through our work we um, support uh, approaches that are regularly practiced, for example, types of navigation that users are familiar with, uh, user interaction um, and interaction techniques, um, supporting contemporary set of input and output devices, they all strengthened uh, compatibility. Complexity uh, is a degree to which uh, users can, adopters can understand uh, and use uh, innovations. And of course, using intuitive user interfaces is uh, uh, one way to address or to reduce complexity providing all kinds of how-to manuals, examples of applications will also contribute to reducing, to reduce complexity. Trailability, uh, we can certainly uh, present clear understanding of incremental growth and incremental process that uh, individual adopters or groups of ado adopters can uh, go when adopting uh, X3D. And observability, we certainly uh, do a lot of effort to reach out to user community, promote shared of um, um, a sense of shared ownership, and of course this is open source effort. So um, it it's uh, a shared ownership is the essence of that effort, and of course make sure that um, our current adopters uh, see th th their adoption, their practices are visible to others. This tutorial is one uh, one way in which we are trying to increase observability uh, and uh, make this community uh, as large as we can possibly uh, make it. Hope the material presented in this section will help understand the work of Web3D Consortium and efforts directed towards adoption of X3D standards. They're both geared towards maximizing user experience and supporting user needs. This section will be followed by presentations done by the rest of the team. Thank you.
we do have uh, plenty of time. Do should we uh, comment a little bit between each each session? What do you guys think? <laughs> Sounds like someone's had his coffee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's out to trot over here. Notice, oh, man. <laughs> no, I, well, I got. I, I just got a blurt that uh, Emily, you introduced me to Everett Rogers and Diffusion of Innovation year uh, a number of years ago, uh, and my goodness, everything starts making sense. You, you know, instead of thinking about what what's today's goal or what's next week's outcome, you just you're just thinking about how do we get to where we really want to be, and what does that mean? No, what does it really mean? And have you thought that through? And 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 just the biggest big picture is is always been my impression. So thank you for so succinctly laying that out today. Well, it's so so easy when we work in on technical problems to focus on that only, and uh, to lose a bigger picture. But the the issue is, and of course we cannot do everything. Um, but it's just uh, uh, being aware of that bigger picture uh, is absolutely necessary because some elements uh, from that, uh, from um, you know, just the fact how society, how people adopt uh, innovations, what what things are matter to them, may influence our design. And so there's that uh, loop, there's that connection that uh, uh, we are trying to uh, to make sure that we we support. Um, it's an intuitive user interface is, is uh, you know, super simple. Um, it's a masses of users don't really have time to go through laborious manuals and, uh, um, you know, dedicate a lot of time. You know, our patience is super short. These days when I upload, including myself, when I upload the application on a smartphone, if I can't figure it out after three minutes, I'm done. Uh, I'm not using right. it anymore. And so that's a, that's a right. tough, um, um, a tough standard to beat. Yeah, and that sounds logical mm -hmm. to everybody except the person who designed the smartphone app. What do you mean they're <laughs> not still trying, you know? Yeah. A lot of times we just trapped with our own technology and think, oh, we need to show this, right? This function and didn't think about it from the user. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad that, uh, Amala, you you start the start the talk. <laughs> so, it sounds really great. So maybe we could we could hear um, um, Teresa's story. Um, she's focusing on web developers, so that's one of the user categories. Thanks, Anna. I'm the web developer who set up the conference website on web3d.sigraph.org as a WordPress installation for the committee. And part of that process was adding the interactive logo to the front page banner. And that's why I'm here. I'm that web author who was a first time user with Web3D and I'll walk you through that journey. But first, let me ask you a question. How many people recognize that the logo in the banner was interactive? Please give us some feedback in the chat. I'm, I'm interested in hearing. This example is a simple branding exercise with an X3D element on a web page. Let's talk about the development environment. I started with a unit test on a local server. Although some JavaScript will load from the file structure, because of the HTTP request, I needed a server so that I don't have an issue with cores, and that's cross-origin resource sharing. It's a security issue, and the modern browsers block it. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. If you aren't already using one of these servers, just download the Chrome extension. It's the easiest way to get started. As for text editors, I use VS Code and recommend you use anything that you're comfortable using. It's nice co that tools like VS Code and others have a quick boilerplate for HTML5. That makes much less typing for me. So in my test folder, I have an HTML file the X3D asset and the PNG material file, well, which is basically the skin. Um, this code 
is just the most basic X3D container with a scene that pulls in the X3D file with an inline element and then sets the viewpoint. We'll talk more about those position and orientation attributes of the viewpoint later. If you don't have a 3D background, that needs a little bit more explanation. So here's the full test case, including the transform and the timer. So I've added uh, the rest of the code in this one. This example was built with X3DOM. That means I'm calling the X3DOM JavaScript in the header, and it needs to be in the header before rendering the X3D element on the page. It's, it's fairly uh, lightweight, so, so this is okay. In fact, it's necessary for the, uh, for the page to work correctly, and the CSS is here too. These two URLs are always the latest release version of X3DOM. One of the things I found useful in this process is to have the developer API reference open, so I've included that link in this page. I've also listed several sites with great examples to start exploring. You can see many different use cases and interaction ideas, ideas in these, and you can explore the Excite GitHub site. Excite is an alternative to X3DOM that's definitely worth a look. Uh, that was the intro and the background. Now let's take a look at this in the browser. Here's what happens if you run an HTML file from the file system and, and hit the uh, cores error. And I'm going to right click and inspect to get to that. All right, that's what it looks like. So we need to run a server. And I have extensions here. If you don't already have this, download download it from the extension from the Chrome store, hit start, and choose the, the folder that you want. Uh, make note that you're on port 8887. And I have it bookmarked here. Oops. There we go, so you don't have to watch me type. Okay? I also, I use localhost instead of that uh, IP address. It's the same thing, just you know, a habit for me to type. So we saw the console log and everything looks fine. Let's look at the elements in here. And here's the scene. That's the code I went through in my example. But there's a few extra things in here that are uh, generated by the JavaScript. So we'll, we'll look into how to display some of this um, in a later slide. So I have a list here of, of uh, debug tools. We covered a few of them. Um, and things like missing JavaScript are easy to figure out because you get an error message. The hard ones are always figuring out uh, what went wrong when you don't get a hint in the console log. Um, if you have an X3D error, then use the valid or use the validator to figure out if that's why your your file's not loading. Another good resource is the uh, Web3D book. Uh, extensible 3D graphics for web authors by Don Brutzman and Leonard Daly, and that's the associated, uh, the companion website for it. Uh, that book's downloadable from the ACM D Digital Library, if you remember. Okay. And the last tool is a great thing to take a look at. It's the, the debug, uh, the X3D edit tool for debug or for just finding your way around the attributes. 
this was an aha moment for me because it gave me what those attribute attribute values mean for position and orientation. So I encourage you to download it from that link and explore explore some of the the um, examples by way of the X3D edit tool. So now that we have our unit test under control, it's up and running. Let's take a look at putting that in WordPress. If you are uh, building in WordPress, then you're familiar with Gutenberg blocks. The conference website is built with a Genesis theme by BizBuddy, one of the better themes I've used. And uh, I have to give them a shout out here. So I added a custom HTML block to the banner and added the JavaScript and div and the X3D elements in, in, that, in that custom block, the custom HTML block. Right. Uh, since the media uploads in WordPress don't support X3D files, I added the assets to the uploads folder via FTP. All, and, and you can tell by the link at the bottom of that of that window. Also, it's important to follow the WordPress convention of root relative paths for these files. Uh, they can be pull, pulling from different uh, locations in the file structure of WordPress, depending on what page you're on and what block you're in. Okay. It's not semantically correct to add the CSS call here. You can either add the CSS as inline code, add it in the customizer, or if you need the entire CSS file content in the repository, then enqueue it in the functions.php and wrap it in some conditional to only load it on the pages where you need it. Right. In this case, I had very little CSS, so I just added it in line. This first demo fits category A of Jacek Jankowski's presentation from last year. Uh, it's the HT, uh, the Hypertext Plus 3D. I've added a link to the original presentation that goes into much more detail for all three of these images. As a branding exercise, I ask you, does the interactive logo inform the narrative on the front page of the conference site? What would you do differently to it? Again, I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback in the chat. Meanwhile, I borrowed Peter Morville's Honeycomb view, UX as a cornerstone from my perspective. It captures my goal in one concise image. It's about serving up valuable information on, on the web and making the interaction and the journey obvious. This may vary by use case, but it's always based on common sense. Extend the existing web paradigms in, in case A. So we have a set already of expectations by the user and we need to help figure out how to work the web 3d interaction in into those paradigms and grow those paradigms from there let's take a small uh, let, take a look at a small interactive uh, demo to show the capability to show some of the things that we can do to make it more usable i used the shady pixel model from mario nagamaro from SIGGRAPH uh, 2017 conference to demonstrate a couple of interaction points. I'm going to ma manipulate the transform and show a simple attribute toggle, provide a little feedback because it doesn't stop immediately. The takeaway is that I can get to any, it, that if I can get to any element on the DOM, then I can use JavaScript to manipulate it. So. Here's a quick shot of the code. The attribute I used to toggle the stop was a boolean loop, so it doesn't stop immediately. Okay, that was probably, uh, there's, there's probably a better choice out there, but I decided to use this as an opportunity to demonstrate a little feedback with a wait message. As you explore all the attributes, you can find a better way to do this. Let's take a look at, at Shady. Uh, 
And I just like to keep that open in case something went wrong and it starts throwing an error or anything like that. Okay, in that case, I hit stop and he stopped immediately. But it depends on where you are in the loop. So that's why I have a little bit of feedback there. And this is what we saw in the elements tab. Where is he? There it is. So I just I, I toggled the uh, the style on this. So measurable UX design considerations from a uh, category A standpoint. Well, I tested these two demos in my typical interaction testing tools, and they don't re render the 3D elements at this time. Hotjar, which is my um, first go-to, actually mentions not rendering anything inside a canvas element. Now for, you, for use cases that are more complicated than our little branding demo and that are hypertext plus 3D, the heat map and mouse interaction would be useful data. Uh, you'll see a, a good example of interaction worth measuring in the weather globe example that Don Brudsman's doing in, in this tutorial. I also always test page load speeds because they're an important part of usability and SEO. I was impressed to see that both X3DOM and Xsite are lightweight. I think that's worth mentioning here. And much like any typical website where the images are the biggest contributor, the X3D file is likely to be the slow part of the load. Both X3DOM and Xsite include a progress bar to help with this. Those first couple of seconds are an important part of the user experience, as is the interaction and the wayfinding. So keep all of those points in mind for your next design. And I'm going to close with a couple more links that I found useful for the, the uh, first timer in Web3D. And if you have any questions, we'll answer them in the chat. Thank you. Thanks. Wow, Teresa, that was great. Thank you. Uh, it really is helpful, you know, for uh, as as Amala mentioned, you know, when we're um, sort of we get into a certain blinders and ruts, and and being able to to get a perspective of um, you know a practitioner and a, and a great designer developer as yourself. I think this is really helpful. Um, help us kind of parse out the way that. Um, you know, that the extra D, even just that initial kind of impression and, uh, you know, the navigation and, and load time can be, uh, can be so important. But I right. really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, it, and it's a new media for us to use in a, in a website. And mm -hmm. there's, there's so many use cases for this. And it can it can make for a richer experience on on traditional websites. So I think that's great. It's just engaging the audience and expanding their their expectations. And for some learning or training experiences, um, having 3D information uh, can be crucial. Right. Right. Exactly. For, for those 2D developers, they can see example, they can bring those 3D object to their website. So it's mm -hmm. doable. So. Right. Thank you. This is great. Yeah, and, and let me say, aw shucks, uh, Teresa, because uh, you said some very <laughs> kind words in there. And uh, 
uh, I think that uh, what might not be obvious to most people is that, uh, boy, we've just been toiling in the small in terms of can we get this to work? Can we that? Can we get this standard to talk to standard and, and line up? And and I, I think you're the first one to get serious with going into production, putting this in mm -hmm. WordPress, the number mm -hmm. one website creator, over, okay. open source Uber Alice and, and just, you know, totally powerful. And, and, and now here we are going, well, you know, uh, we can do that. We can yeah. ask some of the bigger questions that Emil has posed to us, you know, designing with the end in mind and, and you're walking the walk. So I just wanted to right. say, Thank you and uh, big applause. Yeah. Thank you for all your help along the way. <laughs> so just, uh, just jumping uh, jumping in because you mentioned the the logo on the on the conference web page, and uh, well, WordPress is certainly a good way to to create the. the Side, but um, the, the logo is a bit small because WordPress tend to stuff things, and so even a small component takes a large space because WordPress like things very tidy and very separated from one another. So that that's was why it's uh, it's a bit small. And about understanding that that logo is um, interactive, that's uh, that's another point that also occurred in other project. Uh, sometimes when you integrate a, a 3D element so well in a side of the web page, it's completely undistinguishable uh, uh, from an animated GIF. So seeing an animated GIF and that uh, animated 3D logo is exactly the same. That's why in a lot of cases, you have the viewer with like uh, things on, on uh, just to show that, well, this is interactive, you can interact with it. And uh, it, it's a conflict between being uh, uh, tidy and uh, not over the top in presenting your interactive stuff, not, uh, not putting things in, in the face of the, of the user. And on the other side, getting just ignored because uh, the user was just scrolling through and he didn't touch the correct part of the of the website. That's that's always complicated to to do. Yeah. I think it's a transitional point, and it reminds me of the uh, Society of Information Display conference that I went to, and it was the one where they encourage you that the transition into touch screens. We never wanted to touch the screens it would make them dirty. And I was very uncomfortable walking up and touching a screen, but it was the paradigm shift and it happened. And at this point I have an iPad sitting here and I'll reach over to touch my laptop screen and <laughs> it, it will happen. It'll just take a little time. And I think we're in the early stages of that. Yeah, this is, this is super interesting in, in several ways at once because we're, we're coming into a new place, I think. And, yeah. and yeah. Uh, Marco, yeah. your your reaction is, you know, building this it, <clears throat> web 3D conference. Oh, I never even thought to click and interact because I thought it was an animated GIF. Oh, so that's that's like a, 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 a reachable horizon maybe right now that it's not just user experience, it's user expectation. Should we, uh, how, do, how do we change that balance from what, what did the user, the fact that, oh, why, why can't I do something with that? Why can't I navigate? Why can't I interact? And, uh, and then take this last part with the greatest of respect, uh, right. uh, certainly for this team, but please look at our website URL, web 3 d dot sigraph dot org sigraph see the same special interest group on graphics and, and interactive techniques right that we all know we all love that has been around for 50 years 
uh, it has been around since Andy Van Damme said, if it ain't moving, it ain't 3D. I, I invite everybody here, immediately after our tutorial, uh, invite everybody here to go to SIGGRAPH site, go to other sites, go to every small conference in SIGGRAPH, and please tell me, wake me up, how many 3D scenes did you find? I, I, when I say 3D, I'm not saying a beautiful picture, an incredible picture uh, uh, that ain't moving, or a movie that maybe is moving, okay, frame to frame, but it ain't moving with you. It's not reacting, it's not interacting with you. And I, again, I, I say this with respect, none of this stuff is easier, it would have happened long ago, but we're we're striving to make it easy. And, and I just gotta say, when we apply diffusion of innovation, when we apply user experience, when we apply user expectation, well, it, why the heck isn't 3D on the web? How come everybody else gets to do web except for 3D? And, and so, uh, Teresa, thank you for starting to crack the lid off this thing and, and put it out there so people could take charge to interact with. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. And with that, we'll pass it to Fang. No? I think Don. Oh, Don, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. There we We're go. In trouble now. Okay, welcome everybody. We're here talking about Web three D user experience, and I've got a brief tutorial here that tries to go into the detail of how do we craft an effective user experience uh, with fingers right in the the code, the source, the HTML, the X three D, and um, hopefully you will find this useful for uh, creating your own scenes. So let's get into the slides. Uh, OK, so uh, there we are. This is all for the Web 3D conference. And God, dog, I am so happy we are in our 26th year. This is uh, pretty interesting how, how long it's taken, how much has been done, and how much there's still left to go. And this is maybe the the threshold of the next level of how do we integrate 3D on the web. So a simple outline today, four sections, we'll talk about what does that mean, web 3D, user experience, and, and design considerations for your website. And then we'll tease apart, put together a, a globe exemplar. It's not quite ready yet, but it's getting there. And then there are a lot of uh, tools and resources, and as ever, no shortage of future work. Okay, so um, our uh, first section, design considerations. And uh, here's a lesson I learned from one of my advisors many moons ago. Always start with motivation. What the heck are you doing? Be clear about goals and you know what? That's the same as the design considerations we're thinking. So it was great advice back then, it's great today. And we'll look at some of these assets that are available. Okay, motivation. So there used to be lots and lots of talk about how do you do good web design? And that was all good. But then the elevated design of user experience means, well, we're not just asking people what they like, but we're evaluating. We're evaluating whether it's effective, whether you're achieving your goals, whether the user gets stuff done that they want. Can we build in feedback loops to improve our website and go there? So we're working our way up the food chain to get to the next level. And so um, here we go. This summarizes the same words. The motivation is the same. I think it's worth noting that this motivation will probably never go away. Most people in 3D think very hard about this kind of uh, design consideration, but on an application basis. And we have the opportunity now in 2021, in the, the second 
quarter century of the Web 3D conference to say, how do, how do we publish our 3D on the web? No, really, how do, how do we just make it work forever? Okay, now uh, in preparation for this workshop uh, this week at the conference, but over time we found that there's a lot of words out there. There's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of different terminology on how people do it. And so I tried to partition the different vocabularies and where they make sense so that we can be careful about it. You can't tell everybody, hey, stop using this word or say that other word a different way. But these are the four modalities, let's say, or the four domains of use that we got to keep squared away. Of course, 3D model navigation and interaction, huge topic. The, the gold standard there is all the work that's come out of the IEEE VR community. There are great books on this. Uh, there has been rigor that's come out of how does it work, but only by testing. I'm not going to talk about that, but I want to alert you, don't get mixed up. Second, plain old page usability. Oh my goodness, there's hundreds of thousands of resources on how to do that. There's more programmers who know how to use the web than there's ever been for anything ever. Maybe we can use that. Maybe we can take advantage of it. And that's number three. How do we get X3D in there? Wherever our 3D comes from, we want to publish it to the web. We want to make it an effective part of our website. And then that puts us at the threshold of number four, what is our user experience? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are we achieving our goals? So I do got to say a little bit about user interaction in Web 3D and specifically in the X3D extensible 3D graphics standard. We thought a lot about that. And what we do not do is tell everybody how to do it. Rather, we make the author in charge using platform neutral jargon, platform neutral nodes and modes and fields that let you define content that works on a desktop, on a tablet, on a phone, all the way up to a big cave projected on a wall. We don't say mouse click here or pointer there. We say selection. We say, are we navigating by flying or are we, do we have gravity? All the common paradigms, but in a way that has one way to say it. So your content travels forever and it can appear in all of these different places and just still work. So if you want to learn more about that, you go to recommended navigation behaviors and it tells you about that and uh, please do so. Next, what about HTML page usability? This is the essence of it. And uh, guess what? You can be an expert in it, but everybody else is an expert too. How many times have you gone to a site and go, oh, that's, that's not so good. How many times have you ever heard somebody else say, wow, great website. Uh, this, this site, what's the technical term? I, I think the term is, uh, this site sucks. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that anymore, but there, there you go. So is it understood? Well, yeah. Is it easy? Yes. It's easy to tell when it's right. Is it easy to get it right as an author? Mm, no, it's hard. And there are a lot of frameworks for this, a lot of tools. Uh, one of the most prominent is WordPress. We'll learn more about that and just how to do it. It is the most popular website builder. But underneath it all, there is the common standards and there is good practice and it's steadily evolving. So we're not trying to reinvent or pick and choose the winners of any of that. We're trying to say, how do we mainstream our 3D into all that? Okay, so here's a brand new section, a brand new section of the X3D4 architecture. And this is out there for public review. It's currently getting validated in the International Standards Organization. There's about, I don't know, 12, 14 national bodies that uh, have voting privileges based on their attention to detail. And uh, so this is one of the new things in X3D4. And I, I'm not going to walk you through the whole spec, 
there's the the summary of it, but I will tell you that uh, boy, we worked a couple of years on this, and it wasn't the solution path was not writing more and more and more, but but actually writing less and less and less. And how do we let HTML be HTML? How do we let X3D be X3D? This is what we're up to, and I think we've done pretty well on it. Don't take my word for it. You be the judge. Please look at it and tell us what you think. These are the topics we've put in there. They are guidelines. They're not rules, but rather, how can we make it work together? Here's uh, one of the few diagrams that we wrote. Boy, was there a lot of ink spilled on how does how does uh, event loops and rendering work in 3D? Because the 3D community has a lot of competition, per, super performance oriented, and a lot of people who think my way is the best. They may be right, but it's hard to tell who of those many people is the best. So he said, well, you know, uh, the HTML page renders too, and we don't have to make them both the same. We just have to get them to dance together, just get them to work. So what we do, and this was way down in the low level business, is we say, okay, while well, the 3D player, which may render at a very fast rate as control, it handles all its events. And then for that frame, that single, it tosses out what's left. And then the HTML page, which is typically much slower, but still responsive to the user if it, it does its thing. And then it says, oh, I've got some events for you, X3D in the DOM, and send it down. JavaScript, JavaScript is the common uh, glue between these things. So this is our uh, uh, Vibla de France slide of uh, let them all do it. And, and let me point out that uh, unlike most of the 3D applications out there, we have to play well with everybody. There could be not just the local user, but multiple users looking at the same page, multiple users interacting with the same page, maybe even using networking out of bands to talk to each other. So we we have to be very careful. I think we've hit the sweet spot. Please put your uh, your best people on us and tell us how we did. Whew. Okay, let's take a break. Pop up now here. If you haven't taken the time, to look at design thinking yet. Please do. It's a deep dive. You will not regret it. Uh, there's um, so much work on design thinking because it's not that it's necessarily hard or different or unique or especially it's it's a different way of thinking it's it's saying well instead of if i have all these blocks how do i stack them together it's instead saying work with the end in mind what am i trying to accomplish and then let's get a virtuous cycle of feedback loop going that lets that occur so this is really very much in 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 sync with with the kinds of processes we're trying to do and if i had to sum it up in in one case uh uh, uh there's an old joke uh uh doctor doctor my my arm hurts when i go like this and and um doctor says uh, don't do that and, and depending on which state you're in, you might say, oh, and that's eight hundred and fifty dollars or uh, six hundred euros or something. <laughs> it's certainly like that in New York City. Uh, so uh, what's the point? If you're trying to jam a square peg in a round hole, maybe you're solving the wrong problem. Maybe you say, oh, this is not how I force this thing to work, but rather what does the user need to do? Design thinking lets you jump out of the usual iterative problem solving into uh, let's think about the whole problem. Okay, so here's my favorite question. How do you measure that? And and frankly, how do you measure that is, is the essence of user experience. Because if you're not measuring something, then what are we improving? What are we optimizing? Uh, now, please make no mistake, we're not all the way there yet, but we're getting there. We're setting up. We are bringing X3D 
in line with HTML and the whole web in terms of these best practices. And, and when I say X3D, I mean and just about all the other 3D too, because they can do what they're good at, but they can export to X3D. X3D can include user interaction and animation and platform portability is what we're trying to do. Okay, so so welcome to the welcome to the current great challenge. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. And there's a there's a great example on the web 3D page that we are uh, taking apart and putting together again. And we'll show you how some of the tools work. Okay, so um, here it is, the weather globe. And if you go to the web3d.org, you'll see it right up uh, top dead center. And it was done by uh, a student in Virginia under the guidance of uh, Trinkles Paulus, uh, professor there, and uh, let's see. I'm going to try to shift and do this live right now. Let's see if my screen share holds up. Uh, faithful audience, you guys seeing this? Yes, sir. Yeah, Don, sir. Thank you, guys. Okay. So here we are on the Web 3D homepage. Um, oh, by the way, some worked. <laughs> what is this page? Well, this is an HTML page. Oh, and it's got some X3D in there. So if I click and drag on this, if I select and move it around, oh, I'm interacting. Well, that was clumsy. Let me just simply select it. And now here's the page. And if we go, okay, what is the weather in sunny California today? Uh, well, it says right now, let's see if I can get it a little closer. Uh, Arroyo Grande, clear sky, 70 degrees. Da -da -da -da. Oh, it did a web query. It did a web query in the web page. How is it down under today? Uh, Barku, Australia, it's uh, 89 degrees Fahrenheit. They might not use that, but that's OK. Here we go. And et cetera, et cetera. So clearly this page is part of the web and we have an interactive app. So how do we make that better? That's what we're in the midst of right now. OK, so next slide. We have uh, I'm calling our this version uh, that I'm working just to distinguish it. I'll call this uh, test case the X3D Weather Globe. Um, and uh, uh, oh, look, I didn't check, test one of the features. Let's do that. Uh, reset view. Click OK. It went back to the default view. Show that again. I navigated. I uh, rotated this globe object. Got a new weather. And then click reset view. And sure enough, it worked. So we clearly have back and forth going on with. Uh, our web page, our user interacting, our 3D, and our HTML. Hmm, cool. And uh, all of this happy weather was getting pulled down by JavaScript on openweathermap.org. Okay, so um, we love this stuff so much that immediately come up with a long list of, well, what can we do better? How can we make it even more so? And so here's the work list. Here's the link to the page. Let's peek under the hood. Now, we, now we're talking. We've got this globe and the original source cleaned up just a little bit because uh, uh, HTML is pretty loose, pretty accepting of lots of stuff. But we want to make sure it's right. If there's an error, we want to find out where was it. And how do we fix it? So uh, this is the slightly cleaned up version, the tutorial version. You can see the URL on the top. It was uh, a live version we were looking at. And oh, OK, OK, it starts with HTML. Got some HTML meta tags. It's got JavaScript. Oh, those two lines are all you need for using X3DOM in your web page. It's an open source X3D renderer. And then OK, we're back in. Here's our HTML page, div, class, paragraph, 
etc. Oh, look at that. Right in smack in the middle, there's X3D code and a X3D scene graph right there, along with a few extra things, a few decorations for how do we make that work. And I've got links here back to the original if anybody wants to compare how this evolves over time. Okay, so uh, what is that X Read On thing? Well, wonderful library, fantastic library originated with Fraunhofer. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of it. If you're not, please, please rush over there and check it out. And it's a JavaScript library that implements most of X Read D, and it's transitioned to a fully open source project. It's out there, lots of uh, stellar programmers fixing it, improving it. And uh, boy, I, I learn a little bit more every time I go there. Uh, but wait, there's more. We have another open source JavaScript for X3 that also works. And if anything, uh, Xite is, uh, if it's not the most uh, supporting browser in terms of all the features of X3D, uh, it's a close tie for the finish line. They're high above 90%. I, I, copied a few of the examples from their each you can click on each of those postage stamps and get to uh, different examples that's that's maybe 20 percent of all the examples there so um holger seelig's done an immense job there and that's currently our, our default uh, player on our catalog pages so x3 dumb x site you've got two ways to get there from here uh here's an example comparing them now you see in the top, you see um, some XI code. How do you integrate it? Let me back up three slides. What did we have before? Here was what we had before. Here's the X3 DOM version. It's got HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and X3D, all living happily in one HTML page. Now I go down back to slide 18, and we see how does Xsite do it? Well, this is the Xsite design right now. It's all in HTML. You have a different script because it's a different library. You similarly have the Xsite CSS, the Xsite JavaScript. That's your whole open source implementation. But then they've uh, very cleverly, I think, uh, they say, ah, don't put your X3D in there. Just use this X3D canvas node. Kind of similar to SVG cabinets. And uh, you can read more about that. So there's been intense, intense technical work going on over the years on how do we make these things all play to one another. What we're not doing these days is saying there is one right way. Instead, we're saying, okay, okay, there's different ways of doing that on the web. How do we let X3D play? And hence, we have guidelines. Okay, so pressing forward. Uh, I'm not going to walk you uh, element by element through the example. You can go online and that's a moving target. We keep spiral refining it. But we want to make it easy for you to do it, for others to do it. Here are some of the resources that we're using for this whole process. And um, uh, oh, brand new slide, we just tucked this in there. There is a gotcha between the two. Uh, often x and I, I think it's driven by some of the web browsers, they'll smash everything down to lowercase. Well, okay, if that's how they do it, that's how they do it. It's no longer valid if you're looking at it from an XML perspective. But it can still work. And if you say, instead of .html on your file, .xhtml file, you can uh, sidestep that browser, web browser uh, behavior. Or not, to make it work. Uh, it is confusing. <laughs> so if you're confusing, welcome to the club. Uh, and uh, 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 Teresa, Rick, how are we doing on time? Do you think I should tell a joke right here? Oh, you could always add jokes, sir. OK, OK, so here's my, and this is not a joke. This is a riddle, my favorite riddle. What is worse, ignorance or apathy? Hmm, ignorance, apathy, 
Uh, boy, you get a lot of answers to this one. So, well, ignorance is bad. We want to learn more. Apathy. Gosh, how do you get better if you never care? Any inputs from your guy, you guys? It is a riddle. Don't know, don't care, sir. That is the answer to the riddle. Thank you, Rick. I don't know and I don't care. So uh, your mileage may vary. <laughs> it can be wrong. Who's wrong? Who's right? I don't know. But we got to make it work. So what we try to do is keep improving our tools. So we've had a bunch of diagnostics over the last few months that if you do mismatch a case, several of the tools will report it for you. So you at least have a fighting chance. And I'll point out that the worst bug, the worst bug of all the bugs in the universe, especially in your stuff, the worst bug you will ever experience is the bug you don't know about. Because then, then you're back to doctor, doctor, my arm hurts. You gotta, we gotta have tools that help us. That's the state of play today. Okay, next next section of this tutorial, we're just going to flip through. We've got a bunch of resources. All right, X3D Edit. I've been using X3D Edit. I'm building it. We're hoping to get an update to what's out there now. This is code base has been around a long time. We're having a little trouble with the the downloads and the auto installers, but we're making headway on that. And it's basically NetBeans and a plugin. So it's very text oriented, but it gives you pop-ups and tools to um, look up at each and every node, at least all of the extra D3 nodes. So we're starting to add the extra D4 new nodes. It's got, uh, in the lower left, it's got XJ3D, an open source Java browser. And so uh, we're just too long adding stuff. X3D added is how I do a lot of it. Uh, X3D Validator. This is another Java-based tool, but we've put it online. How do we take our quality assurance tests, of which there are indeed a lot, and we smash them all together? And I just clicked on the quality assurance page. This is part of the X3D. Look, I couldn't even fit it on one screen. It keeps going on how you do it in all the different ways. The reason we have all of these is because we found that no one technique no one technology can handle all of the expressiveness of X3D. The uh, computer science term is they have different expressive power. We're saying, OK, let's do them all. So you can uh, upload a file. You can give it a URL and validate our current uh, improvements. We've uh, got it pretty much so it's HTML agnostic. It just ignores those and will only give you diagnostics of your solo X3D scene if it's embedded in, X, in an HTML page. That's our current embellishment. All right, so uh, let's see if I can go the right direction here. X3D resources. You can see from the menu list at the bottom, we got a lot of resources, and this is just a, a list and a summary of stuff. Every time somebody announces a new capability, we go, oh, thank you, and we put it on here so you can share it. So if your tool is not listed or your capability or your example or your whatever, please tell us. We'll add it. That's what Web3D Consortium, that's what the X3D community does. We similarly have a page. It's not resources and links to stuff, but rather gotchas and hints and helpful statements about how do you do each and every one of the topics that are in there. And um, also got tooltips, and uh, these tooltips are cool because we didn't write them from scratch, but rather every time somebody asks a question, we go, oh, that's a good question. What's the answer? It's kind of like an FAQ, and it's also cross-linked to all these different ways of how do you test X3D, how do you validate it, how do you convert it to programming languages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's an excerpt from that tooltips, and you can see the kinds of levels of detail. There's a lot of repetition. We have def and use. How do you put an ID on a node uh, in X3D terms? But we also uh, uh, have unique stuff. What is 
What does the load field mean? It has no effect because Anchor inherited from another thing. We have a very clean object-oriented design now that works across multiple programming languages. Okay, a couple of gotchas on, on uh, web development. Most people develop, develop at home on their own machine or on a standalone machine. And a few years back, uh, the HTML folks added a really strict mechanism in most of the browsers. And that says if you have resources coming from more than one website, you have to give permission for that so people can't do man in the middle attacks. Okay, so that means that if you want to pull down an X site or pull down an X readom, some of these other things, jQuery, whatever, uh, you got to handle course. So there are links for how do you sidestep that stumbling block. Chrome just learned this. This is maybe obvious to a lot of web developers, but Chrome just gives you one. They put it in. So if you want to test your HTML in Chrome, that should be pretty straightforward. And then just to make sure nobody's forgotten, security is important. If you haven't yet added HTTPS, the secure protocol to your web server, uh, it's never been easier. The Let's Encrypt project is open free. It even automatically updates your certificates, et cetera, et cetera. So please join the 21st century if you're not there. And I've tossed in a few uh, interesting references. These are, gee, I, I don't know if everybody knows about these, but these are books. <laughs> anybody anybody use books anymore? Uh, I, you know, I, I like books because they're random access. I can Around. I found these books are great. They are online. Your mileage may vary. If you think there's more we should look at, please tell us. Okay, future work. This is, uh, boy, if we let it, this would be the longest part of the slide set. There's tons to do. We're not quite there yet. We have not closed the loop of user experience, but we're on our way. And this, is, these are the stepping stones to get there. And if Tens of hundreds of thousands of websites can do it. Gee, maybe we can too. Uh, I, I think our threshold is not just existence proof, but easy. Easy, that's where you want to go. Towards that end, uh, maybe maybe this JD Pixel guy, he says this is a really cool model. We've got some versions of it online there. Maybe we could use JD Pixel as our guiding light avatar peeking around a website. So if you're interested, there's a link there. Come on in and come on, get involved. We've well, we have the stalwarts working on these things, but uh, success equals everybody can do it. Either enjoying it as a user, or uh, uh, getting fulfilled as a web developer on how do you make it work. Oh boy, and uh, we've got to do list too. Okay, so, uh, well, I will mention the last to-do list. Gee, why can't we publish 3D everywhere? Why can't we have stuff from whatever, and if we could save it out as X3D, have that perfectly, wonderfully unique 3D experience that somebody wrote, but have a version that your uh, mom and your colleagues and your kids can see too, just on the website. That's me, and uh, that's the talk. And if we got a few questions right now from you guys, happy to take them. What do you think? Great stuff, Don. Thanks. I mean, uh, I think this is true. You know, the um, the we're, we're it certainly feels like we're on the cusp of something. You know, and, and sort of as Teresa was helping us understand the different ways of that uh, this media can be combined. Um, but then, sort of seeing the weather example, where you know, you know, if you speak web, we can we can use that data, right? And, and it becomes this whole nother level of integration where um, the 3D, maybe it, I mean, in some ways it should be special, but in some ways it's just another, uh, you know, another medium, another data type on this rich, on this rich web. So I think that is what we're looking for. And, um, 
And I appreciate that uh, you sharing those, sharing that example. So maybe with the last uh, little, we have uh, some some more time. We could probably kick off. Uh, is there another section or two? I think. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Thank I you, hope Mark. you guys have a good conference so far. Welcome our session. Um, let's see. So the topic today I bring to you is harassment evaluation from 2D to 3D web. And here is an outline. And talking about harassment evaluation, we have to introduce um, Jacob Nielsen, who introduced the 10 harassment design principles in 1994. Um, so this principles can apply different interface design and interaction design, not only for the web, but as a web developer, 2D web developer, or uh, user experience uh, uh, study researcher or usability study, um, you have ever done that, you know how important this harassment evaluation uh, process is. Um, here's a link for um, Nielsen and Norman group to explain more details and talk about today's topic because our conference is a web 3D, then uh, let's see what is 3D web side or environment. So Yasek actually introduced a definition and gave us three category of uh, 3D web um, last year's web 3D conference. So the first of the category is hypertext. That's, that's mainly 2D environment having a 3D object as part of the, uh, the website. Then you can interact with the 3D object. The second part is 3D plus hypertext. So the order change, that means the mainly object is to, uh, 3D object and then 2D information as a system to explain the two, 3D environment, 3D object. And then the third one is more immersive, um, total 3D environment. And in this talk, a lot of times I'm referring to the 3D unless I say something different. So when we're conducting harassment evaluation using those 10 harassment design principles, we need to consider what our uh, subject is, is 2D, 3D. So Let's compare what's the difference between 2D and 3D. Here's a long list. I'm going to highlight two things. One is for 2D website, your evaluation, your user actually is outside the screen, right? You're outside, you're interacting with text, with images, with videos that have very limited, inter um, 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 you know, you have a um, control panel there for video. But for 3D website, 3D immersive environment, then you have this avatar represent you, represent user to be inside of the 3D scene Then you moving the direction and to explore the scene, right? So another significant difference is the navigation menu. For 2D website to be success, we have to go through or needs to find the analysis, all the information as uh, you know, uh, key content, and then build an information architect and creating the set map or set structure based on the information con uh, strike, uh, ar architect. And so the user will be able to find information based on the ma um, navigation menu. And so we heavily depend on navigation menu, successful building this navigation menu or information architect will leading a, a successful web website. We spend a lot of time on that. In the 3D world, and you don't really have a menu. You don't have a 3D um, 
navigation menu. So your menu probably going to spread into different format, right? So think about a user's perspective. And if I want to uh, conduct it efficient, efficiently on the tasks I want to do and um, build an easy um, to use a 3D website and efficient, consider efficiency and effective. So I always, always want the following question to be answered, like, who am I? Is this avatar represent me? Where I am? What is my next task? How to get there? How to conduct a task? So first, who I am? Again, with my avatar, I need the avatar represent me. Is the avatar too tall or too short? I'm looking at the floor in the first place. So can the user customize my own character with a user control? And how do I know my navigation type? X3D allow multiple navigation type, walk, fly, exam, or any. So when we change the navigation type, how can we know? Is that sound? It can have a warning or something um, coming with it. And in the beginning of help document, maybe you can show how each of the navigation uh, works. But where I am, how do I find out where I am? I often lost in the 3D world um, if there is no a map. So I was asking my daughter the other day, I said, if we're walking, shopping in the mall, we get lost. How do we find I mean, a way out? She said, ask a person there who work there, a smart, maybe a smart assistant. And she also say, there is a booth that have um, a map, maybe a 2D map, a notation. And we're shopping in, you know, Target, Walmart, they always, Publix, they always have L sign. The sign need to be visible so we can know where to go, right? So uh, what is our next task? Is there any way we can, here we talk about maybe 2D area can help um, to enter and customize, uh, user can customize, um, a task list there, or you predefine a few tasks for them, click, check on, so they can um, doing uh, manipulation or interaction, just like early on, we saw the globe um, down with showing the globe, you get different options, right? You can see the, uh, the globe changes. And then how we get there, again, here is kind of map can help the sign, viewpoint. Um, so on the way to get there, if we have a different floor, I often see those 3D games and you, you get into the scene and you know you jump around from different floors. In, in, in real life, we really need to, um, a lot of plays have, watch out your steps, right? And to make sure user knows before they you know, fall to another level. So are we having those kind of real life experience to uh, mimic in the 3D world? Is it unnecessary? It's just something we need to think about how to, uh, how to give, what kind of experience we want to give, uh, how to conduct a task, mainly about the interaction with the particular objects and the manipulation, like, creating a 3D sculpture, then you need to give some feedback, maybe um, haptic re re uh, uh, reactions so the user will know, oh, they are cutting a piece of clay and with the, uh, in the mouse or uh, joysticks and arrow prevention, if they are walking on the bridge, you don't want them to just fall. When you design the bridge, you probably want to just like the real life, you put a bar on the side to prevent them to fall off and collision detection to make sure there is, you know, they cannot just go through fall, right? 
and when we presenting uh, uh, the um, area or a door to be opened or a drawer to be opened or a machine, you can click and get them out and to see the detailed designs. You throughout that your your um, scene, you probably want to use consistent. Um, you know, indication like a blue glow, glowing button throughout the scene. So user can have a studied, oh, that's the button you can click, right? So here's the three um, category of uh, challenges, summarize, initialization, and navigation and interaction and manipulation. So this is something we would like to check on the, um, what we designed a 3D web interaction. Um, this is a, a working in progress checklist. It's not, um, uh, it's uh, welcome for any comments and feedback. Um, you can start trying to use it and see if anything would like to add in. For initialization um, phase, we would like to first uh, get um, user be able to uh, initialize or customize avatars and help decks we help document we would like to provide those hot keys how to navigate how to interact with objects and maybe a map to show um, uh, a location and if we can give the user option that customize the task list will help them to uh, more efficiently conduct the, the, the task. For the navigation categories, we want to be very clear on where the user current location so they don't get just roaming around and exploring. And sometimes maybe that's the purpose, but um, um, viewpoints um, and navigation options uh, need to be easy to find. Um, so drop down menu and see the navigation options or or uh, or the viewpoint options, and hopefully we can support uh, revisit. User can control that they can add a viewpoint, um, so they can revisit. It's like we shopping in the mall, we saw the stuff, but we came back to that shop to buy stuff, right? So they can customize the viewpoint to to quickly jump back to that point. Um, for st uh, system status, we would like to have uh, acceptable rendering time and loading time, right? And for interaction part, we need to have consistent standard, uh, standard uh, with conventions and what we use in industry, like sensors throughout the design, we want to have a consistent um, presentation um, and if giving feedback, um, either sound or haptic uh, feedback, error preventions on the design, we need to have a very avoid user uh, making uh, accident, right? Or giving um, that, you know, that end road warning sign. So just, just like the real life. Um, this is a, a Kind of the summary um, here for the check checklist, um, and this is a reference uh, the Jacob uh, ten heuristic design principles and uh, yeah six um, usability of three D web applications as well as um, Sutcliffe's um, heuristic evaluation for VR as well uh, during this study. And we would like to take questions at the end of the, uh, the very end session. Um, so I think our next talk is um, Dr. Phyllis will give you some 101 on the, uh, the evaluate, 3D evaluation use both the study. We will talk about a lot of research method, how to uh, get to evaluate um, usability study. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Excellent, excellent, Feng, thank you so much.
You know, there's a, it really does strike me and I, I'm so happy that you've pulled this out as one of your, your you know, your big concerns, uh, which is about the sort of the navigation and the feedback and, and thinking about the kinds of guidelines uh, of how we, you know, pr provide this to users. So certainly the, the mall metaphor, you know, really makes it uh, make sense to me, right? We having an overview map to start out like with where am I uh, is, is a really great um, feature. And, you know, we don't do this very well in X3D, although there's all these modes of, um, you know, navigation, we don't necessarily show the user or tell them what mode they're in when they load the world, right? right. Uh, which might be actually a good idea uh, in terms of usability. Like, oh, because as soon as I click and drag, if I'm walking, I'm, well, some one thing's going to happen. But if I'm examining, I'm going to end up on the other side of the world. And it's too late at that point <laughs> to tell <laughs> me, exactly, right? That's um, exactly what happens when uh, I just kind of uh, throw all the technical behind me. Just think yeah. about if I'm the user and I don't have any idea when I get this scene. Oh, I got lost. I think that's the obstacle for us for Web 3D object to moving to be a general user. Mm. Um, so we, I think we need to um, <laughs> work on that standardized or giving a, a common um, convention. So, so, so um, the programmer, designer, and the user all have in the same page. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the things that yeah, I think it's in one of the resources, I'm not sure if it's the Sutcliffe one or not, but um, you know, they talk about teleportation and navigation between these viewpoints. And I really love your idea about how to make this whole thing more usable. Well, obviously, 3D bookmarks, uh, you know, my viewpoints in, yes. in the metaverse are so, going to be super important <laughs> in right. the future, mm -hmm. right? because I want to get back to those cool places. Um, but as I travel and as I travel between places, like it's not necessarily a great idea to just teleport the person there, even if it's an animation. Like oftentimes it's better, and this the research in VR tells us this. It's like actually you take the person up above, give them an overview, and then bring them back down, right? You don't just shoot them over to the next place. And so simple techniques that, as we start to have a discussion as a community, you know, and, and look at different ways of practice, I think this stuff will start to shake out. But I really appreciate you identifying those. Um, those are the key elements to me as well. And the research in um, uh, virtual reality suggests that um, when we don't have um, uh, a lot of visual cues, um, the navigation or wayfinding is much, much harder. Um, so it's it's not easy job. Um, we get lost in uh, physical world <laughs> where we have all visual cues, um, or you know that's kind of gold standard. Um, but uh, in in virtual world, we miss uh, so many of them. So some mechanism need to be present there. Right. Some some technique maybe not mature, or we can work towarding to support those functions. Um, yeah, to get it better use experience. So everybody love to use it. Yeah. Yeah. And we're sort of in that, um, in that phase where, you know, I mean, we've kind of, you know, when people think about the paradigms of user interfaces, like we're kind of coming off of this, uh, you know, windows, icons, menus, pointers, the whole desktop metaphor, the WIMP metaphor. As soon as we get 3D, we're kind of that kind of goes away and we have an opportunity maybe to try new stuff or maybe to bring some of the better elements from the WIMP metaphor forward uh, instead of the baby in the bathwater kind of a thing. But I think um, I think that's really valuable kind of opportunity to, uh, to re-examine those metaphors. And, you know, there isn't necessarily one right one either. There's better, right? So this is the whole reason like the 3D user interface community, you know, is still, you know, doesn't want to standardize anything because it's still too early. We don't know enough or you could use, you know, the research isn't there. But somehow I think we're on a on a trajectory where 
together we can start to under you know uncover some of these metaphors and figure out the ones that stick and, and maybe the ones that don't um and I and I think uh, we're working like we're trying to converting the 3D world to a 2D web or 2D interface too long. And we forgot, oh, we were in the, the real 3D world. We can mimic rather than we have to matching. Uh, just like a, a big example about the stove, our cooking top. And I was thinking, oh, we need to match those buttons, right? We need to make sure that the location is matching with those cooking eyes. And in the 3D world, we even don't need the button. We can use a finger just like, uh, you know, uh, making the circling. And then it mimics this heating up part, probably have a more um, easier, um, more direct interaction. But really just through those basic, you know, working in progress checklists and to see, um, more comments and give um, we can work more on the complete list. So, yeah, right. And every every checklist helps, right? Because in a certain way, it helps you think about what you've done just from that other perspective, from that other point of view. And that's a, those are really great tools. I'm glad you brought those up. They're, those that's a great topic uh, or target, I guess for for our community and, and the working group, for sure. Awesome. Well, we're so, uh, to your session. <laughs> Would okay, you think that okay. we dive into your session? <laughs> okay, great, we'd we'll be happy to. Um, and it's a nice segue too, um, from those checklists into um, some of the other methods. So um, we'd be happy to start the the last section. Thank All you. right. Well, good day, friends and neighbors out there in Web 3D land. My name is Nicholas Paulus, and um, I'm really pleased to have about a half hour, 40 minutes with you here this afternoon or today or whatever time it is uh, on the interwebs to talk about uh, really a 30,000 foot view of user experience usability and to give you a couple of ideas about methods and terminology that we use when we're doing design and evaluation, really from a human computer interaction perspective and a user centered design perspective. So hopefully by the end of this piece of the tutorial, you'll have a sense of some of the different approaches where they might be applicable and um, I do have to apologize. There's a lot of text in these slides, but that's so that you have things to study and um, research uh, on your own time. So we'll get started here. So we're really looking today here on uh, the two sides of this little loop. And this is about iterative design, right? And what we really need to do is start with why and how users are going to engage with our web 3d content with the user interface that we present to them and to do that we really need to understand their goals and some of the tasks and motivations so i'm going to talk about how we can bring those considerations into our design process make sure we're building the kind of tool that's going to be adopted and used. And then, of course, we have all kinds of great technical folks here in the audience and so on. And that's when you would prototype some example of your interface. And then how do you know if you did a good job? How well did we do? Well, that's when the test and evaluate phase comes in. And there's a whole set of methods which we'll mostly spend our time on today talking about some of the ways we can say uh, with evidence, you know, how well did we do? Are these designs any good? Are we on the right track? Is this something that uh, will be an advantage to users and they'll have a, a positive user experience? Okay, so this is an iterative cycle, right? We're generating lots of designs and ideas and we're trying to reduce those so that we can implement something feasible, right? And uh, we do this with this 
iterative process of prototyping and evaluating. Okay, so Tamara Munzner uh, presents a pretty nice framework for us to sort of break down some of the considerations in our design process. This works with visualization and certainly with Web 3D as well. But like I said before, starting with the domain situation, the user's motivations, know your audience, right? They, this is the first rule of, uh, of musicians, but also for uh, any kind of user experience um, designer, right? So knowing what our users are doing and why, what's motivating them. Within that, we kind of break down their different kinds of activities and what sorts of tasks are they trying to achieve with our system? Okay, and so that's the things that our user interface will have to uh, enable and support and with different kinds of algorithms and so on under the hood, right? So I guess I want to make the point uh, here early that when we're doing design and we're trying to make usable Web 3D systems, it is about a big picture, right? It's not just about... Um, this cool game that I saw and uh, we're going to implement that, you know, that's not going to be a successful strategy and all good user experience teams, right, are going to look at the big picture, they're going to look at the variety of users, like where they land in their demographics and skill levels, they're going to think about their motivations, right, they're going to think about the context that they work in, you know, social and organizational kinds of contexts. And requirements, you know, for success of, of the system and of our user interface can also come down to just sort of being able to put things in a familiar context. So look and feel uh, can also be really important. Okay, so I just wanted to remember that uh, we won't be successful unless we launch in the right direction and with some some data. Right. So again, Thanks, Tamara, uh, for a great textbook, but uh, a really nice taxonomy, at least in the case of visualization, right, of what sorts of tasks and why are people engaging with our visual content, right? Are they trying to compare some set of shapes, right? Are they looking at um, a network topology and trying to discover uh, some kind of connections there, some kinds of features? or a correlation in that network, right? So these are words we can use when we're thinking about what do our systems do and why from, from the user's point of view, okay? So we do need to really spend time on requirements engineering if we're gonna make a successful product. And so we can design a good solution. So how do we make sure that we're um, you know, covering the bases and really addressing the kinds of things that our users are going to care about. Well, here's where a whole great contribution and uh, literature comes in, uh, in terms of usability engineering and words like cognitive ergonomics, right? Like making the system work with the user. And this is HCI, of course. But we're really trying to put the user at the center of this design process. And so when we think about what they're doing and why, we're talking about activities. When we're thinking about what we show them uh, in various orders to for them to complete their tasks, that's information design, right? And we've got a pretty good handle on that with 2D web pages. But when we get into information rich environments like we have with HTML plus Web 3D, uh, there's a whole new design space that's worth exploring about how we lay out and design our information presentations. But probably we spend a lot of time in user experience, especially on the web, thinking about interaction. And of course, navigation is a big one. We're trying to control a six degree of freedom virtual camera, right, with a two degree of freedom mouse maybe some control keys or something, right? So we know that 3D user interfaces and 3D interaction design is, is really a place that's worth uh, spending time in our design and evaluation process. We want to make sure that we can set goals we achieve. So usability engineering really, as we'll see, kind of talks about, okay, well, we need to be able to achieve this task in a best case scenario in a, you know, under a minute 
worst case scenario, three minutes, right? And that will uh, feed forward into how we continue our design and, and iterations. So we'll see that in a few. Okay, again, just for reference, wanna make sure everybody has a handle on some great resources that are already there. And if you're serious about this field, you will have, um, have read these. Okay. So how do we figure out what our users are doing, what their needs are? Well, you know, we, we can take a couple of strategies. I'm gonna mostly focus here on interviews and questionnaires, but observation and ethnography are really important, right? So looking at current usage patterns with digital tools, how they work in the workflow, who are the stakeholders who, you know, approve and contribute at different points in a life cycle of a product design, for example. Uh, ethnography, qualitative research is really important. Um, but we can kind of leverage stuff that we know, right, of course. So <clears throat> we like questionnaires because we can get these out to a lot of people, uh, distributed. Uh, uh, we have a downside on this one, of course, yeah, maybe the response rate isn't too high or people only answer the first couple of questions. So, you know, this has some trade-offs as well. If we wanted to really dig in and talk to some, you know, representative groups and spend a lot of time, maybe with a few, we might get more high quality information uh, to, to feed our design. But um, this will also, you know, on the flip side, take a little more time and, and in terms of resources in order to talk to everybody. Okay. Um, and this kind of qualitative stuff really helps us to get a bigger picture in words that aren't ours, right? They're the user's words of how they think about the problem, right? How they see the, the landscape um, of solutions, the design space. So one of the things that we do if we have done some interviews or uh, a lot of qualitative kind of research, we try to do some categorization, you know, do some content affinity analysis, sort of try to group our different things by themes and try to understand, you know, what is it that really users are talking about? What are they concerned about? What are the, the metaphors that, that they're using, right? And so with a bunch of data that you've gone out and gathered from some representative user group, you can now start talking intelligently about what a good user experience would be. Right, and what might be adopted and, and used in a, you know, even a daily basis. So everything is trade-offs, right? There's no right answer uh, in user experience design. And what we're trying to sort of provide here is a way for you to say why maybe one design is better than another, okay? Because they all have pros and cons, right? And so reasoning through these design trade-offs is sort of the, the real specialty here of, uh, of user experience, okay? So let's say we went out to the world and we, we got a bunch of data and we decided that we're gonna design, um, you know, a, a, a web 3D environment where, for example, users could go and um, take a virtual field trip for their certification of continuing education, let's say. So let's say we build something. Well, do we need to build the whole system, right, to figure out what navigation type we should use? No. Uh, do we need to build the whole system in order to figure out, you know, if uh, we need three different charts or five charts? No. Right. So one of the things that we want to always think about in design is avoiding premature commitment, right? And premature commitment leads to something that we also call confirmation bias, right? So if I only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Part of design is to break out of these models. And when you sort of hone in on a specific design decision, like how do we display the detail of a tree in this web 3D environment, information design question. Or how do we enable the user to navigate quickly um, around uh, a photosphere plot uh, in the forest, right? That would be an interaction design problem. So really what we wanna make sure too is that we don't try to uh, prototype 
such a big system that you know uh, it takes us months we want to be able to do this quickly and iteratively so always trying to make sure that you prototype to your question right to your design question Munzner has a nice framework now going back to what we saw before about the domain and the task and so on uh, and some threats and ways to evaluate how well you did at each of those phases or for each of those concerns. I guess the one big one at the bottom I would like to say is sort of if you got it right with the domain and you did all of that uh, data collection well, you know, this is something that would be adopted, right? So that does validate that you're actually working on the right problem for your target users, okay? So we can approach evaluation really with, I would say two main branches of methods, okay? Two different kinds of methods. The first kind of method is an analytic evaluation. So this is a kind of evaluation where we could look at our system and derive some kind of uh, performance metrics or review of it without actually using real users. Okay, so sometimes this is called discount methods. Uh, it's certainly easier to do this with a handful of experts than running a full study. And these are kinds of things that you might, uh, will, might fall into this category of analytic evaluation, right? So expert reviews, um, checklists, guidelines, you know, heuristic evaluations, some of the things um, that we've seen earlier in this workshop, for sure. Uh, but analytic evaluations can also be uh, based on certain kinds of laws, like Fitz law, right? So you could evaluate how fast a user could click through five tasks just by knowing the distance between the buttons, right? And you could use that to uh, basically choose between design A and design B because you know it takes less uh, scrolling, for example. Okay, so you could do this with algorithmic means as well. Um, so these discount methods are uh, often uh, pretty accessible. There may be a variety of um, sort of checklists depending on you know what kind of hardware maybe you're using. You might be doing these um, walkthroughs or checklists in, with individuals or groups of experts, right? So the difference here, cognitive, pluralistic, uh, cognitive walkthroughs. And so the kinds of things that we might look for with these checklists, right? Different sorts of inspections, features, consistency, right? Are all of the pages like conforming to the similar, you know, standard of, uh, information quality, for example. Okay, so some more required readings. Uh, here again, along that idea of analytic, heuristic checklists, guidelines that I could go through and evaluate as an HCI expert or user experience expert and evaluate a given design. Now that's in contrast to empirical methods, empirical methods that use, you know, real users. So this is, opens up, um, I think, a great Pandora's box in a certain way, right? Because uh, there's lots of different kinds of users, and often they're one of the better ways to break our own confirmation bias uh, because they they always act in unexpected ways, right? And actually, a good user uh, will will challenge your assumptions and, and break your interface. And that should be a learning experience, right? That's a positive thing. So we kind of think of uh, these empirical evaluations, which we deal with users, two levels. Like one is sort of more of an informal, uh, small scale usability tests to kind of figure out, you know, as we're iteratively designing and prototyping, you know, how does this one work? Uh, is this better versus uh, maybe at the end of our design process, we really look at a more controlled experiment and we say, hey, you know, our products or interface is better than the other one. Okay, and there we might use a controlled experiment and really dig into kind of like the scientific method. So just to get a flavor for this, I'm going to have a few minutes um, on this slide and then 
move on. I encourage you if you'd like to uh, to take this now or later. But it kind of gives you a sense of one of these quick formative kinds of usability surveys, um, which uh, actually was also a piece of the a paper that we wrote and was presented earlier today on X3D field trips. The design challenge there was, you know, how do we get these uh, foresters who have never been in a 3D environment, they've been walking around the woods for their professional lives, um, to gain the correct kind of knowledge in their professional certification program, right, with a virtual interface, with a web 3D user experience. And it came down to, again, one in this case, like you'll see the difference between a navigation type, between controlling that six degree of freedom camera for this particular audience, this particular task. Okay. So while you're um, enjoying that, uh, very simple, kind of quick and dirty, but a usability evaluation that's using users, that's you, uh, to gather some evidence about which way should we go with this design trade-off, okay? Well, if you are running formal studies, uh, you often want to be going through an institutional review board. Uh, all universities have this. Many companies uh, who do this kind of work contract out to uh, have, you know, basically another set of eyes that endorses the protocol and the methods of this data collection. And really what they're worried about is protecting the rights of those subjects, of those users, and making sure that you know, your uh, study is ethically conducted, uh, i.e. that it will benefit the same people that you're studying. Okay. So when we do this academically, we always have to go through the IRB. And uh, certainly if you are going to publish it, you will want to do that too. Okay, so what you have is kind of like a mix of questions there uh, in the survey, and we'll we'll think about uh, some of these as we go forward. Okay, so first of all, um, just to get some terminology about these empirical methods, right? There are empirical methods that are qualitative. That means that. We're not just worried about numbers and measuring stuff in this reductionist way. We're actually more interested like an anthropologist, right? In understanding users' approaches and affect uh, and um, you know, their reflections about learnability of the interface and stuff. So qualitative investigations are good and they're valuable. And I, just because I'm gonna spend a lot of time on quantitative ones, doesn't mean I'm discounting them, of course. They're, they're really crucial. And I know some of my colleagues on this tutorial will, will emphatically agree. Internal validity. This is the idea that uh, I'm giving uh, my study is uh, consistent and that uh, the data and the way I've collected the data supports it, right? So this is things like, uh, you know, ordering effects, um, things like that, making sure that the question of the hypothesis matches the prototype that we're uh, presenting to them. And of course, our external validity, that one, when we're talking about that, it's sort of, we got this result, is it really meaningful to anyone outside who we studied? <laughs> right. Okay, so a quick breakdown of these empirical methods, kind of the, the formative, fewer users, uh, more kind of qualitative oriented feedback, which is our usability test. And then maybe something that we might do at the end of a design charrette, right, is do some kind of controlled experiment, like summatively, and kind of look at our final result, and maybe compare it to uh, the existing practice, for example. So a quick set of uh, differences there. So I mentioned usability engineering and the idea of making goals for these designs. Uh, here's just a, one technique that, uh, again, comes from the Ross and Carroll sort of line of thinking, is that we set up a, for each of our tasks 
uh, we set up kind of a target for performance, right? Should the user be able to do this? And here in this case, 10 seconds, right? Uh, our worst case is a minute. The best case, if they're really good, they could do it in three seconds. Okay, well now let's try a handful of users. How well did we do, right? What was our observed uh, time of performance, okay? And once we do this, we might sort of approach it with um, a different way than we would for a formal experiment, right? We're only thinking about a handful of users, three to five. Um, we're talking about a lot of sort of softer data collection, right? So taking notes, um, maybe screen grabs. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do consent forms if you're not capturing their face or identifiable information, right? So there are certain um, advantages to be able to do these quick iterative usability evaluations and go sort of towards your target performance levels. Uh, we're always making sure that uh, we're make, we're putting our users at ease, we're not evaluating them, right? We're evaluating the system, right, the interface. So we always remind them of that at the beginning. And we allow them to encourage them really to think out loud, because again, that qualitative thing of what are they thinking about as they're navigating the system really helps us as designers to, to address and, and to maybe pick the right kind of way to resolve a design trade-off. Okay, definitely looking for you know breakdown situations and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we're taking notes, they're talking out loud. We might do some rough measures, right, of time of performance to you know find the most least expensive house if that was their task. And, and then we're gonna try to figure out, okay, well, now how do we go forward with the next round of design? Like, is this a real problem? Uh, and we can start to rank uh, these problems by, you know, importance and then figure out sort of, well, you know, this is a quick, easy fix. It's a low cost. So maybe that, you know, sorts up by uh, it's a must fix, right? Or if something was of a really high importance, even if it costs a lot, we're going to must fix it, right? So kind of sorting then as you go around the loop for the next design, what are the important things you should be focusing on? You've had a little bit of evaluation that's really coming from your user group. So we can do, you know, we're simple solutions, fine, no problem. Um, but oftentimes that think out loud information, that qualitative information gives us a new design opportunity, right? So, oh, the user didn't know they could zoom in. Hmm. Well, now how could we portray that to them? How could we give them some visual feedback or something about their zoom level or about their control and agency over their zoom, right? And so now we can keep that design loop going, right? Because we know that this actually could be, uh, you know, we might think about some different solutions to this user problem, okay? So usability experience, experiments and evaluations are really great for this formative kind of quick identification of problems and uh, bringing the design forward. Contrast that with the controlled experiments, which is something that you'll see a lot more of in you know, publications like IEEE VR or ISMAR or these larger studies. Of course, medical journals are more like this too. Uh, we really are looking at statistical evaluations of large numbers of users, right? And so we really have this whole new challenge now of formal experimental design. And uh, with the last couple minutes here, I think I want to just give you a sense of kind of what are the important things when we're looking at designing a study uh, that we would want to publish in, in a venue like this, okay? So the first thing and uh, this may or may not be obvious, but is to have a hypothesis, right? Like we believe we have a trade-off here about uh, how to navigate the photosphere, right? Well, we believe that uh, an embodied metaphor 
um, is going to be uh, more natural for users who are not 3D graphics experts. Okay, so the first thing we do that means you know navigation type A versus navigation type B. The way to do this uh, scientifically, right, is to pose it as a null hypothesis, which is that there is no difference between A and B. And in the face of just uh, random noise, there's no difference. And so if we can disprove that, the null hypothesis, then we can actually say uh, that our hypothesis is true or false, okay? So a couple of terms that you'll see, and you're gonna, we could spend um, several class periods <laughs> Uh, on experimental design, and indeed, uh, we do that. But uh, quickly, just so that you have some of the terminology, right? Independent variables are the things we're going to change, right? So the navigation metaphor, right? If it's uh, camera centric or body centric, right? Um, maybe it's the task we might want to see about if it's um, counting the number of trees. Or how about, uh, which might be a, a simple counting task or a comparison, like which is the largest tree? Um, those would be different task types and maybe different conditions for, uh, for one interface to shine or another. Uh, maybe the interfaces are better at scaling. Okay, so you might present you know, condition A and condition B and uh, have some different treatments about um, you know, here's 100 trees, here's 10 trees, here's 1,000 trees, right? So how well does the user interface kind of scale to the, the content that it's uh, portraying, okay? So these would be things that you can control as the experimenter. And then dependent variables are the things you measure, okay? So if we're talking about quantitative or objective attributes, right? How long did it take you to find, to count how many trees were in the plot or to find the largest number uh, in the image? Um, did you get it right, right? What was the accuracy rate? These are all objective dependent variables. Oh, there are also uh, some subjective ones, right? You remember the one to five? Uh, you know, frustrating, easy, uh, this kind of Likert scales, these are subjective variables and they require some different kinds of treatment. And we'll just sort of quickly talk about that. Okay, another idea when you're designing your experiments is to consider about how your conditions are distributed between subjects and or within subjects. And there are, so the other way that you need to think about um, using users in your experimental design. Generally, we can split it up into between subjects, which is not what we did tonight, right? Tonight we did, uh, everyone was saw both conditions, navigation type A and navigation type B. So we did a within subjects design uh, in that quick survey. Okay, generally you can get a little bit more uh, statistical power uh, with between subjects. If you know a lot of the IEEE VR and academic studies and 3D user interfaces, right, are more like 16 to 24 users, right? Whereas these larger NIH studies are with are between subjects, you know, with hundreds and thousands of people. So they are kind of operated at a different scale. So I wanna quickly talk about uh, one assumption, which is about the normal distribution. As you can see here on the right, there's lots of different statistical distributions. We're gonna assume normality uh, for some of these fun reasons, uh, but we also need to pay attention to uh, proving this before we go forward in different kinds of statistical analysis. So let's talk quickly about um, some of these different descriptives and what they're good for and uh, and not. So I guess the first thing was, uh, let's say we had everybody there and we timed you how long it took you to count the number of trees. And uh, we then we averaged them all up and we said, okay, well, the average performance time for the embodied navigation was this and the average performance time for the camera navigation was that, okay? Well, uh, 
on the surface that looks pretty reasonable, but in fact, you know, it really is only comparing two values, right? What we actually want to do is know the real picture, right? How are those data distributed? And in fact, that's what we use statistics for then is to compare all of the data and the distributions relative to the normal or chi or other distribution uh, to try to understand are these is this random noise or is this something else so i like to use this example where uh, the reason that detail matters uh, in terms of distribution so i could give you i say here's a data set and oh it's big data you know but here's all you need to know about it right here's the number of n and your variance and your mean and all kinds of great descriptive stats but the problem is that all of those stats describe any of these plots. So the actual distribution, right, that I just described could be any of these actual data sets, okay? So we know we're losing information if we just collapse it to averages or stuff. And for quantities, okay, that's important. What about those subjective measures, right? So those Likert scales of ratings. So here we're not really going to use the average, right? Because you know one person's three is another person's five. We might actually use more of a median or a mode and consider it as a another kind of distribution in our statistics. Okay, so knowing that what your question types were drives what which of these kind of statistics you could use. Okay. So knowing again which statistics to use based on your experimental design, we spend a lot of time on that in academia, but here's the sort of the, the punchline slides. Okay, so let's say we ran our statistics, the correct statistics for our data, and we found a p-value of less than 0.05. Well, that means we've disproved our null hypothesis, right, which was that there's no difference besides random variation here. Well, now we're actually 95% confident that there is a difference and that it's not due to random variation, right? So this leads us to a conclusion about which one is better, okay? And so wording the confidence of your p-value is really important. Now, what if you didn't get less than 0.05? Well, it doesn't mean that there's no effect, right? They could still be different. Um, but that maybe random variation washed it out. And so maybe you needed to, uh, in order to detect a difference, come up with some different tasks or some different dependent measures. Um, you might not have enough statistical power in terms of your users, right? So there are a number of reasons why uh, actually no result is still a good result in science. And uh, I will stand by that statement. Um, but just a quick kind of look at how we kind of look at controlled experiments and how we position them and our arguments about why one ex user experience would be better than another, okay? So we've got an iterative process. I hope that uh, this little overview, 30,000 foot view gave you some terms and some ideas about these different methods all the way from checklists to, to formal experiments. And I'm looking forward to, you know, even more of these kinds of studies in the Web3D community as we scale up with more of you uh, practitioners and um, researchers looking at how usable is Web3D. So I wanted to finish with uh, just a quick pitch for our working group in the Web3D Consortium. Um, all of my dear co-presenters are meeting with us uh, on a bi-weekly basis in that group, and we're developing a whole set of a kind of an agenda. We have put together this charter, and we hope that you'll join us, you know, which is basically to bring user experience practitioners, which is pretty good in 2D and interactive into now web 3D and these information rich kind of environments that we have. Try to uh, promote best practices, try to understand our different kinds of evaluation methods that we can adopt as a community, right, to be able to compare some of these, these different issues. 
And so it's a rich, exciting future. Uh, some of the things that we're going to keep working on, right, are, uh, again, trying to scale Web3D interfaces to a variety of audiences. And as you know, the Web3D consortium has a whole set of vertical working groups with different domains. All of those audiences have different stakeholders. And so it's a hairy problem. Um, but I believe that with a, a dedicated group of folks and um, some, some proven methods that we can bring to the table that will continue to improve the accessibility of web 3d environments into the future so i look forward to working with you and and join us please uh, in the web 3d consortium and to improve the user experience of web 3d content generally all right so we'll have a little time for q a and this will end the the video recording thanks so much Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe that um, kind of concludes the, the presentation part of the tutorial. And I know there's um, been some great questions coming through in the chat, some great dialogue. Um, I want to continue and address some of that. Um, and, and the first one, I'll just take the easy one off the top. And so sorry, um, Fong, because that, that is, you know, taking the easy one off the top. But <laughs> Um, William uh, Glasgow uh, asks about um, cookies and and how you know they might be used in uh, in, in Web three D and uh, for user experience data and I I think this is a great insight you know we had uh, once upon a time um, there was this great thing uh, that we used to sniff called the user agent right. What browser are they on? You know, mm, what uh, what screen size are they? Right, you know, and we could actually change what kind of content we delivered based on that, right? And and of course, in the old days, that was a necessity because you had to have a version for Netscape and a version for Explorer, and what a mess, right? But but really, I think what you're talking about is there's this information that travels with you, right? And so. Um, I think some of us have talked about this uh, in, in other venues, for example, in Korea and HNM is like, what if the user agent actually had your, your arm reach, right, or your interocular distance? Uh, wouldn't that be really useful for any engine to come up and sort of tell you about like how to give you good stereo, <laughs> right, if you put a set of goggles on? or how far you should scale your go-go technique because your arm is only a meet, you know, 50 centimeters instead of someone else's who's 70, right? to, to experience the same, right, agency in the world, right, with a certain kind of 3D interaction technique. So I think there's a lot of power there. Um, for better or worse, the, the web XR community has um, kind of been treading lightly around that because it's kind of, personal identifiable information. And so uh, I think there's a, it's, it's a worthy discussion, but it's, it's sort of this, as I understand it, the state of affairs is that, uh, you know, the WebXR community doesn't really want to touch the user agent data because of that. And I, even though I agree, it would be a, a real boon to usability in, in some of these situations, but I don't know if some other folks have more information or, or uh, opinions about that? Nicholas, you are very much right on that. Uh, there's an uh, element of convenience and uh, uh, usefulness that we can find there. Nevertheless, um, we, we also learn hard lessons that uh, everything that you, you, you have, it can be useful and it can be also misused. Mm. And so user tracking and uh, uh, PPI, personal, personal identification uh, information, it's... Um, yeah, the community will need to, to talk about that uh, a lot. Um, I know we, uh, I was talking to, to our students about uh, ideas of having metaverse and we are going to now, uh, you know, complexity of uh, um, 
uh, 3D uh, situation that su support, support uh, uh, persistent environments where you, you know, always up and running. Um, you know, we think that uh, uh, Facebook and the text and video and, and uh, visuals are massive. Uh, well, just, just wait until you see have 3D. <laughs> So there you have also text. You you have <laughs> um, a, a visual uh, and also movement. You have uh, movements, mm. and so how do you figure out what's threatening, what's uh, uh, bullying in um, uh, in that type of environment? Uh, the level of complexity goes high. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and and. Um... And I don't know if it's true, but it sort of seems like in, in the same way that the ge geometric um, scale, you know, sort of um, multiplies on itself. So does the the complexity and the kind of the issues that that we have to think about. And certainly, I you know, there's it goes deeper. And I, I think this is a great group to um, you know talk about this kind of stuff because, frankly, you know, we've been doing metaverses for 20 years and so you know have putting a lipstick on a new pig doesn't really isn't going to change the fact that it's a pig you know i'm sorry uh it didn't work the first three times and just engineering your way out of the paper bag isn't going to do it and, and i think that this requires kind of really deep thought and not just engineering thinking right so i think that's another big theme of our tutorial here today is like you know, that's not going to solve it, right? We, we really need to kind of bring out some new methods. And uh, if we're going to break through um, and make this usable, safe, right, secure for, for all the kinds of people that we want out on the web. I like this question. Um, should there be a legal working group uh, in the Web 3D Consortium? Uh, you know, I certainly think of our community as an advocacy community, as, a, as an organization that should be writing letters to leaders and policymakers. Uh, absolutely. Um, because we are, um, you know, the community that has the most experience and, and at least some right insight into this after 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's not just about, um, you know, the liability of, of so-and-so putting a cookie uh, with my arm reach or my interocular distance in the web browser, but it's, yeah, there's ethical, really ethical uh, kinds of discussions that have to happen when, you know, I could show up in the metaverse as, you know, like Tim Leary said, you could be anyone this time around. Well, where's where's the responsibility of a of personhood and who's actually a citizen in this kind of place? I mean, bots? I don't think so. Right. So these are all these are all really great questions. And um, like I said, like the the Web three D community since since Snow Crash and, and Vermal, we've been we've been wrestling with these. So I'm really excited to. To getting more ideas and um, and all of the applications that are that are possible now too. I think since some some of our um, attendees mentioned uh, AI and uh, advances in AI um, are coming to the fold to to VR, but that we we had them uh, already. Um, I think we used to say the dumb AI, <laughs> but they're not going to be super that dumb anymore. Um, and so um, you commented uh, um, the issues like personhood. Uh, I remember article by uh, our colleague, uh, Woody Barfield, uh, who speculated on three scenarios. What would happen if uh, AI, uh, the agents become really, really smart? Um, so people are working on this. Uh, so ethical issues in virtual reality, for example, are becoming more and more topic in research community. I think it's super important, uh, you know, as a community and, and of course to us as educators too, to have, have this conversation regularly up in front. Um, it's not something that 
you just sort of osmosis, you know, it, it somehow from the culture. It's a, it's got to be addressed sort of head on. And I, I really appreciate uh, the way we can talk about these things in the, in our user experience group. But as users, uh, I think you are right. We have to uh, get education ourselves. Um, at the beginning, you, you are really basking in plentiful of, of experiences, but over the time you, you kind of sharpen your tools. Um, some for uh, good, some for not so good <laughs> purposes. So we have another question. Uh, Nicholas, can you check? Sorry, yeah, there was some good discussion about um, from a usability point of view about how, um, you know, drag and drop could be leveraged in the context of, you know, web 3D and uh, these information rich kinds of environments, you know, where we're mixing 2D and 3D. And I, I think that's a really great insight. Um, you know, the so far we've done pretty simple things with this. I mean, if you talk JavaScript and standards, you can drag and drop stuff into your web browser. It's, it's not rocket science. But you know, triggering things that are useful, that's the trick, right? Or, or, or valuable or have some kind of value proposition, right? So um, there's an example, I think I put it public, was um, the Web3D Consortium you know, Medical Group was like, hey, wouldn't it be great if everybody could put their own you know, MRI and X-ray scans and see it in the web browser? Well, yeah. <laughs> so we did it, right? And it doesn't go to a, some server somewhere. It's all processed on your local machine, safe, right? You just drag your DICOM files over here and there's your spinning volume rendering. Um, so, you know, being able to bring different kinds of content, you know, into this web space, I think is really exciting, right? I mean, not just for conversion, that's kind of wonky stuff, but like for real, um, you know, things where, uh, you know, if I am participating in an environment, you know, I'm not just really talking about like typing in some code in a console, like, yeah, let me throw in the, you know, that, that 3D model and, and, and see what, you know, what happens, right? So I think that drag and drop would be a, a great kind of focus uh, for the group too of like, you know, how does that work? And what are the different ways that that interaction, you know, which we kind of know about for 2D, how does that same interaction, what are its implications if you have web 3D? Um, I think that's a great, great kind of design, design thread to, to go pursue. I have a comment on Carol. Carol had two questions and she stumped me with that first one because some of the tools for testing usability on websites are out of the reach for small businesses. And I personally, uh, with, with complex forms, have literally sat like this with a user and you want somebody that's maybe not your husband because they're uh, a little biased already or they know too much. They have too much context and, and pull in a couple of the key personas and have them sit and walk through the page with, with their uh, screen shared so that I can watch their eyes. And that helps. So that's the poor man's solution, Carol. And uh, the other question, I think if you have a fixed workflow or, or a fixed use case, then you can set up a workflow that's specific to your scenario there with the small business CAD file. Uh, so it's not the, the broader case. And that's what you posted, uh, the URL that's addressing CT scans. You know, it's a specific workflow. And I think that that gets you past. It's not a standards kind of a question, but 
more of a specific use use case where you can say, okay, drag this kind of file and that kind of file and have this set of, of interactions, then you can make it more drag and drop. And, and I would say team up with, with the, the 3D person. I don't have a 3D person, so I don't have content, but I can write the JavaScript. And, and, and that's part of the issue. And one of the reasons I was thrilled to be here is because you have to, you have, to have the, the, the full uh, skill sets in order to build something, you know, the right team. Yeah, full stack developer. Yeah, <laughs> that's another subject altogether. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. That's what we train here at Virginia Tech. But that's anyway. I've been really okay. enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoyed this discussion. And um, if we can stick on a little bit longer, or if any of our uh, Fong, do you have anything you'd like to say about the, the working group before we go? <laughs> I think we got a, um, this is a great discussion and I think I hear a lot of voice and a good research method and procedures from different point of view, um, you know, 2D, 3D web developers and users. Um, so I think we got a lot to do. <laughs> there is a lot of good ideas, you know, uh, we have a heavy load now. We were, if we want to satisfy by moving toward to Web 3D, we really have a lot to do. And um, I think our group need to take on the um, task and um, be uh, the platform and uh, um, the media with the user, with the developer, everybody um, together, work together, um, moving this Web 3D um, being possible. Um, and go back to our original thinking about what what the 3D world we are living in and to uh, think about <laughs> what we, we should do in the 3D web. Hopefully, um, you know, in a, within a decade, we can see that real 3D web, just like a, a 2D HTML X3D became um, a popular, uh, as easier use as everybody wanted. And just to mention, uh, new members are most welcome. So if there's a topic dear to your heart and you would like to influence it and uh, bring about uh, best optimal uh, solutions, uh, just join us. That's as it is, it is simple as that. Yeah, you can be user, you can be developer and uh, you can be designer. It can be from any angle of this whole thing. We can together make this happen. Absolutely. It's really exciting to be looking out onto uh, such a wide horizon. And uh, I want to thank my, my speakers here for standing with me and looking out to the great wide yonder. Um, I really think there's great things to come. And uh, I do invite everyone to, to meet us up uh, at our next meeting and, and contribute. So thanks so much. And especially for those uh, East Coast uh, and U.S. folks, I know we're burning the midnight oil here, but you know, it's just like the grad school days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, my next meeting in just a couple more hours. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> oh. right. see you morning then. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Thanks so much, Thanks, Web everyone. 3D. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.